Thank you, Ian, very much. Um, it's, it's funny, when I first accepted this invitation to speak here, it was before even the date of the referendum was called. Uh, and then the date was called, and, and I, I confess now, Ian, I, I, for a long time, two months ago, I was like thinking, do I cancel, do I not, you know, should I be in London for this or whatever? But I thought, no, I want to stick with this. And then I was busy campaigning on the referendum. I'll talk about that more in a moment. And, and it sort of slipped my mind. And earlier this week, I thought, hang on, I'm delivering the keynote at 9.30 on Friday morning. Whatever the result, that's the only thing we're going to really be able to talk about. So I said to Ian, scrap what I was going to talk about. Let's just have this session to reflect on this. Which does mean, of course, that I've been thinking about it a lot the last hour or so. Um, goodness, what a result. What a result. Uh, we often say in history, people remember where they were when JFK was shot, when 9-11 happened. And I think all of us will remember where we were today when we heard this. We were in a tent in Plymouth University <laughs> in the rain. Uh, can I just check? It'd be interesting for me. In the room, who's from the UK? Okay, so the vast majority of you. Uh, res born resident in the UK. Well, let's put it this way. We're allowed to vote. Let's put it that way. Right. Okay. Who's from the EU? Okay. Thank you. From yes. Yeah. For today, we're all still. All of the previous ones are still in the EU. Uh, and who's from from outside the from a non-EU country, not including the UK, because we're still an EU country as of today. Right. Okay. Thank you. That just gives you a sense of it. Very useful. So, uh, Friends of the Earth campaigned really hard for a Remain result. We, uh, we've written lots of articles in the press about this the last few months. We had around 60 of our local groups campaigning to Remain. And why did we do that? It's very simply because we think environmental problems are best solved by countries working together. The environment does not recognise national boundaries, as you will all know. And therefore, the best solutions to environmental problems, uh, particularly the global ones, are those that happen where countries come together and collaborate. And actually around 80% of our environmental legislation in the UK as of today derives from the EU. So we've been very worried that a Brexit, what does that mean for our environmental legislation? Do we lose huge swathes of environmental legislation that's taken many decades to campaign for? So I've been very outspoken in the last few months. We've had all kinds of problems with the Charity Commission as a result of this and so on, campaigning for a Remain vote. Um, and I'm very grateful to the three people from Friends, from Friends of the Earth Europe groups, uh, groups across Europe that have offered me political asylum this morning. Uh, very, very grateful to that. Now, I'm not going to make uh, too many assumptions here, but you know, if we, if we follow the demographics, uh, if there was a sophologist in the room here, they would predict that the vast majority of you probably also voted Remain. Uh, I'm not going to make too many assumptions about that. I'm sure there's some people here that, that voted leave, and we need to respect that. But those of us in the tent here this morning, the very fact we're in a tent in Plymouth University in the rain this morning, means whether you consider yourself to be this or not, most people in this country would consider all of us to be part of an elite, an educated elite. And so we have to, we will be finding this result today perplexing, and we're not alone. The fact is, 48% of this country did not vote for this. Scotland voted very strongly for Remain. And Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, has said this morning she now thinks this will spark another independence uh, referendum in Scotland. My own prediction is this time Scotland will vote to leave the UK. Northern Ireland voted to Remain. Uh, Sinn Féin has said this morning uh, that they think this should trigger an independence referendum for Northern Ireland or to join Ireland. The Irish government this morning has said this has profound consequences. London voted firmly to remain. Where I live, Cambridge, uh, I haven't checked the results yet, but I can be pretty confident, was very strongly remain. Here's the real killer one. 70% of 18 to 25-year-olds voted to remain. This has been a very divisive and very polarising experience for the United Kingdom. And as Friends of the Earth, we pushed really hard to try and get the environment on the agenda in the referendum. And we succeeded a little bit. You know, occasionally people talked about that if you want to solve global problems like climate change, we need to work together. 
But actually, those campaigning to leave hardly said a word about the environment during this whole campaign. So the first thing I want to say very clearly, I don't believe this gives anyone any mandate to remove environmental laws or legislation in this country. If it had been talked about, if it had been a mainstream part of the debate, then maybe there would have been a mandate for that. But when the Leave campaign has said we should take back control, and OK, 52% of the country have agreed with them, they didn't say take back control to get rid of environmental regulations. So there's no mandate for that. We do need to pause and ask ourselves how did this happen, however, and what does it mean for the environmental movement? Despite this being very perplexing for many of us and for the great sadness I, understand, I feel personally today, I actually understand some of the issues as to why 52% of the population voted against this. Some aspects of it I don't. I, I don't have a problem with immigration myself, uh, and I find that a very offensive kind of debate. But I think there's something bigger here than individual questions. I actually think this result today, in a way, is a natural consequence of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has been a project that's been running for decades in which a section of the elite have essentially ignored what's needed for people and the environment, I would say. It's been to say we have to put neoliberal economics first, above all else. And then when we've got decades and decades of amazing economic growth that we're happy about, only then do we think about people and the environment. That's what we've been lectured to for years. More importantly, as a direct result of this, politics over the last two, three decades has become something that hasn't been done by people or even for people. It has become something that has been done to people. So I think there's big lessons for the environmental movement there. Because all of us in this room know that what's needed over the next few years is transformational change, not incremental change, but transformational change to the way billions of people live on this planet. If we're going to have any chance of living fairly within environmental limits, we can't have the economy wired the way it is. We cannot have these huge inequality between rich and poor, both globally and within countries. And we cannot keep ignoring what the science tells us about the environmental crisis. And as Ian quoted from the interview I had in The Guardian when I started this job, the environmental movement was very good in its early days about inspiring people, getting people involved, whether it's around saving whales or recycling or whatever. But then what happened is we became a victim of our own success. Suddenly the doors opened to us in areas of power. And roughly, I think, and I'm talking very generally here, of course you can find all kinds of exceptions, not least within Friends of the Earth. But through the 1990s and the 2000s, the doors opened and perhaps we confused access with influence. For too long, for too many people in the environmental movement or whatever contribution, whatever label you want to put on it, those of us trying to fight for a better, more sustainable world, for too long we've been focused just on the facts, the science and the policy. Lots of effort has been put inside the Westminster bubble and the Brussels bubble. And we thought expertise would win this. I am so fed up of seeing lots of presentations of wonderful McKinsey cost curves giving us a perfect example about how we can make a transition to a low carbon economy. As if it's ever going to turn out like that. The one thing we can guarantee is change does not happen in a way that is devised in a clever model or by clever people. Change has to be something that is not done to people but by people. For all of us in this room, we would class ourselves one way or another as experts. Michael Gove, one of the leading campaigners for the Leave campaign, said a couple of weeks ago, people have had enough of experts. So there are no solutions to environmental problems that can be done to people. That's the thing we have to remember. The only solutions are those that are done by people. And let me give you one example of how this lofty rhetoric translates into reality. 15, 20 years ago, Friends of the Earth was campaigning for a big increase in onshore wind farms in this country. 
and we were 100% right to do so. Onshore wind has been a huge success story in this country. Uh, most people are, would be shocked in this country to, to be told that last year renewable, renewable uh, energy contributed to 24%, a quarter effectively, of all electricity produced in this country. And there were lots of experts who told us that couldn't happen, certainly not by 2015. But the way we campaigned for onshore wind farms 15, 20 years ago was predominantly to talk about climate change, and not even that, to talk about parts per million and percentage reductions. If we could have our time again, with the huge benefit of hindsight, if we could run those campaigns again, I wish Friends of the Earth had put more effort into promoting a model of community-owned energy, where the real benefits of wind farms would be felt by, and I never use this phrase, ordinary hard-working people, but you understand what I'm saying there. That everyone felt that they could have a stake, they could have agency in the low-carbon transition. That is what we, in this whole movement, whether you're in academia, whether you're a campaigner like me, whether you're in business, what all of us have to do now is wake up from this result and realise that if we are going to have any hope of delivering the kind of transformational change we want in the future to deal with these issues, we have to absolutely ensure that people can feel part of this and that it is their movement, it is their change, not one being done by us. And this is absolutely not a unique issue to the UK. You know, what we've had here, this is our version of Trump. That's what's being, that, you know, and, and it, it will be rerun later this year. It's almost exactly the same issue and debate. This is just our version of it. Just very recently, you had a, a, an election in Austria to a new president in Austria. And it was a very close run thing between whether it was a far right president or actually the president uh, they ended up with there, thank goodness. So I'm going to give you five key points to reflect on, and then if there's time, I'm very happy to answer some questions. First, and perhaps the most important thing to say to everyone today, but perhaps most importantly to those people that will be celebrating today, the Leave campaigners, this is no mandate to remove environmental regulations. If you wanted it to be a mandate to remove environmental law, you should have bloody talked about it in the campaign. Instead, you were completely silent because you know that for the environment, the better option would have been to remain in the EU. Secondly, to all of us who are trying to fight for a better world, movement building is incredibly important. This has to come from the grassroots. All of us, even organisations like Friends of the Earth, that is fundamentally about the grassroots. It's in our name, bringing people together to take common action on the environment, Friends of the Earth. To an extent, we've neglected the grassroots in some ways over the last 10, 15 years, as we put a lot of effort into Westminster and Brussels. And we decided a year ago to change this, and we've been scaling up the effort and doing a lot to scale this up. This isn't something I just suddenly thought of this morning, thankfully. But I share that with you now because we've all got to think about that. Critically, when we build, rebuild grassroots, when we engage people in this debate, it's also got to be, we've got to think about the diversity that's needed for doing that. If what we succeed in doing is engaging lots more, let's be frank, white middle class educated people, but just people that perhaps aren't in professional academia or business or environmental organisations, that will fail as well. We need to make sure that we are engaging people across the social classes, educated and uneducated, uh, people from a wide range of ethnicities and cultures and so on, to do that in every town, in every country. The next thing to say is in this debate, there was a lot of talk about that this would be about putting the great back into Britain. A lot of rhetoric about making Britain great by becoming independent again. Rhetoric, I think, was nonsense, but all the same. Well, there's no great in Britain if actually what this means, Britain becoming the dirty man of Europe once again, as it was in the 70s and 80s, before EU legislation told us to clean up. If we really want to be Great Britain rather than Dirty Britain, our vision now should not be just to try and cling on to little bits of environmental regulations that we've got, 
but actually let's surpass the EU on this. Look at what Norway's doing. Look at how they're now thinking of banning petrol cars by 2025 in Norway. My message back to the Leave campaign is if you really believe in a great Britain rather than a dirty Britain, then our aim should now to be have higher social and environmental legislation than the EU, not lower. What does that mean for farmers? And we're obviously going to have to replace the common agricultural policy with something else in Britain. Let that be something that is a lot better than the common agricultural policy when it comes to the environment. The common fisheries policy, let it be something better. Now, I said throughout this campaign time again, the problem with those policies was not the fact that they were common, it was the policies. So it's perfectly possible that e for the EU to have a common agricultural policy and a common fisheries policy that's good for the environment, and I hope the EU still goes and does that. But what Britain now has to do is have policies that are much better for the environment and for fish in those areas. Because very simply, if this now means that the, the, uh, we end up with dirty Britain instead of Great Britain, then the campaigners for leave sold us a lie. And the final point, much as I personally and Friends of the Earth is on the losing side of this debate today, we really strongly believe in democracy. And so we are now determined to make this work. And we're determined to do everything we can as the leading campaigning organisation on the environment in this country to make sure that this does lead to higher environmental regulations and a better environment in Britain, not a worse one. And we've been putting all our effort into that. We don't just believe in democracy, we also believe in one other thing. We also believe in internationalism. We believe in countries working together to do this. And 48% of people yesterday voted to remain because they also believe in internationalism. But you know also, probably a lot of the people that voted to leave weren't rejecting internationalism either. They were having problems with specific issues or whatever. So I think it's now more important than ever for the view that people have of Britain in the world from other countries, that Britain, everyone in Britain reaches out and to be honest, invests in love and friendship across international boundaries to work on issues together. We won't be doing it through an institution like the EU, but that doesn't stop us doing what needs to be done. Thank you very much.